Good evening everyone. Tonight is the last prayer corner devotion for a while as we are able to recommence with normal prayer corner from next Wednesday onwards, uh, God willing and depending on the weather. And we have a double parable to finish this series with. Before we look into God's word, let's ask for his help to interpret it. Most wonderful Lord, as we look at this parable which you told at the beginning of your search for your apostles, I pray that you will teach us and help us to understand its meaning. Amen. And so here is uh, the, two, the double parable. Luke chapter 5 verse 36. He told them this parable. No one tears a piece out of a new garment to patch on an old one. Otherwise, they will have torn the new garment, and the patch from the new will not match the old. And no one pours new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the new wine will burst the skins, the wine will run out, and the wineskins will be ruined. No, new wine must be poured into new wineskins. And no one, after drinking old wine, wants the new, for they say, the old is better. Amen. That's God's word. Now I did a quick look at Christian books which were written about new wineskins and that seemed to be a never-ending list. And this central concept that something new cannot be safely contained by the old, that concept has fired the imagination of Christians for many years, probably centuries. And it's usually interpreted something like this. Jesus is the new patch, or he's the new wine. And the old garment or wineskins are Judaism, the way that the Jews have been following the law, the Torah, for centuries. And here's the new guy, now with a new way of doing things. And so the old ways need to change well, to fit in with the new ways or just need to be replaced in order to fit the new ways in. And so for centuries people, have been, have, people who have new ideas about how to do church have been using this parable to justify throwing out what they don't like about church. And I'm sure you've come across situations where a group of people have caught a vision of something new, something exciting, which they want everyone else to get on board with. And so they're going to throw out the old to do it. But what is the problem of this fairly traditional way of looking at these parables? The problem is that last verse 39. No one after drinking old wine wants the new. For they say, the old is better. So if the parable is really about changing church structures or changing church practices, New Testament over Old Testament understandings, then why does the parable finish by saying what you had first was better? That would mean that the old covenant was better than the new covenant and that the old way of doing church is better than the, the new way that the Spirit is leading. So what's going on? To shed some new light, I came across some information from a Messianic Jewish source, a Messianic Jew, and he pointed to what is called oral tradition. What's that, you might ask? Oral tradition. Well, you may have it in your family, because often in a family there's someone who likes to tell stories usually embarrassing stories of when you were a youngster. And so often these stories are told using the same words every time. In fact, everyone has by now become a bit sick of the stories, but still they're told in the same way every time, and everybody knows the punchline. So when a, tra a stranger is told the story for the first time, it's a bit like an inside joke, where everyone vicariously participates in the telling, and tries not to spoil the punchline they know is coming. Well, in a time before today, in a time before many books, the people who were good at remembering a discussion word for word had an important job. 
and some of these became the storytellers for their community. And they made a point of telling stories the same way every time, for they were the newspaper, they were the reference book. They were the people that you googled if you wanted to get what happened. That's oral tradition. And the main book in that tradition, the Torah, the Old Testament as we know it, was memorised. You see, you couldn't take a paper book home. The scroll was kept down at the synagogue. So you had to take a section home in your mind from Sabbath school. And there arose around, and in this tradition, a community of people who had the job of studying the Torah, thinking about what it meant, teaching talented or fortunate people how to read and write, and this was the scribes and the Pharisees. Over the centuries, occasionally a guy with exceptional talent would arise who could write down some of the oral tradition, the shared wisdom of centuries of studying the Torah. Now, without going into masses of detail, we do know that in quite a few places in these writings, uh, that wine is mentioned. And how did the rabbis and their, and their writings use wine? In a particular collection, one of the more famous ones, a particular connection of wisdom writings called Perke Avot, Chapters of the Fathers, vessels containing wine are not institutions. They're not religious movements. They're not teachings. The vessels for containing the wine are individuals. The wine is the teaching that the individual consumes or contains. The vessels are individuals, the wine is the teaching. So let's remember that Jesus was a Jew and he spent much time speaking with the people who guarded and maintained the oral tradition, the Torah and the associated writings. Remember, he stayed behind at the temple talking with the wise men. His family didn't know and went off home. So this means he understood the way these people maintaining the tradition, the oral tradition, he understood the way they thought. He understood the ideas in their heads. And let me ask you this question. Did he invent parables? Well, no, he didn't, because this way of teaching truth was around for a long time. It was a well-developed art form. So Jesus when he used parables, was trying to connect both the scribes and Pharisees and their teachings, and also he was trying to connect with the average, fairly poorly educated people of that time. So, if vessels which contain wine are people, and the wine is teachings, that fits very well in with the context of this parable. You see, the context is always important to work out what is going on. And the context here is that he's just been involved in choosing his apostles. We see in verse 27 and 28 of this chapter, After this Jesus went out and saw a tax collector by the name of Levi sitting at his tax booth. Follow me, Jesus said to him. And Levi got up, left everything and followed him. You see, the context of this chapter is that Jesus is fully involved in choosing the group of individuals, the group of people who he will train, who he will teach, mentor, guide, and generally pour his teaching into. He is choosing the vessels into which he is going to put new wine. And this double parable speaks to what's in his mind about his choice of disciples. He's looking for certain characteristics in his future disciples and he is not looking for the same thing as the scribes and Pharisees, which is quite apparent from verses 29 to 32. Then Levi held a great banquet for Jesus at his house and a large crowd of tax collectors and the others were eating with them. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law who belonged to their sect complained to his disciples. Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus answered them, It's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. 
I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. We may not understand the choosing process that went on there in our day of free public education. You see, in these days, education is available to everyone, but in those days it was not. If you wanted to get the education, now a good education, you looked around for the best uni? No, there were no universities. You looked around for the best guy you could find. And then you had to approach him and negotiate and see if he would take you on. Often you would go and live with him in his household and trade your labour for education. And you were not trying to learn a commonly agreed national curriculum. The main aim was to end up doing, saying and living life just the same as your teacher. We don't go to school today to end up doing life just like our teacher, do we? No, we go to learn a subject. In those days, you went to learn how to do life like your teacher. And that's what a disciple was. So at the feast that Levi threw to celebrate getting taken on by the new holy man in Israel, we see the other teachers looking askance at Jesus' choice of students. These guys who are hanging with Jesus would certainly not have made the cut at their school. The disciples of the other school complained about the unsavoury character of Jesus' disciples. Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Because these other teachers, they wanted clean living, culturally similar students who were well behaved, already on the right path to their version of holy living, and from families of good community status. No rebel. No rebel would be allowed to pick up the pearls of wisdom which they wanted to pass on. And if you understand that disciples often live with their master, then that meant they ate and drank together, so who you ate and drank with was a big issue in those days, because you mostly did that with your disciples. Well, Jesus wanted to point out to the scribes and Pharisees a couple of differences in the way he was going to do things. And first is the fact that he himself is the bridegroom. Look at verse 34. Jesus answered, Can you make the friends of the bridegroom fast while he is with them? But the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them. In those days they were fast. I'm wondering what they thought about this outrageous claim about how good a teacher he was. I mean, announcing himself as the bridegroom is an astounding claim of authority. It's like saying, I am the guy. I am the man. Well, we know now that he was saying that he was Messiah. But they, it was very early in the piece for them. And they probably thought he was just saying how good a teacher he was. Probably thought, oh, he's got tabs on himself. At the very least, he was saying that getting signed up with your new teacher, that's a great reason to celebrate. Well, let's save the prayer and fasting for another time. And then Jesus starts to talk about how new his teaching will be. It will be like a new patch on a garment. It will be like new wine, this season's vintage. And new patches and new wine do not go with old garments and old wineskins. The patch will be stronger fabric than the original and you'll probably end up with more rips than you had before. New wine will lead away at old wine school, old wine skins, and it will lead to holes and loss of the good stuff. It needs new skins with the capacity to absorb the chemical reactions of the fermentation process. And what does it mean? It means that you don't want to start teaching people who already have preconceived ideas, who have already received a great deal of training from someone else who already have their head filled with ideas which may be contrary to what you want to teach them. I'll give you an illustration. There was a celebrated metal welder who was known in northeast Minnesota for his excellent work in the US. And he often remarked, 
He'd rather teach welding to a drunk in a bar who had never held a welding torch in his hand than to hire a welder with previous training and experience. A man who had never been taught to weld was teachable, still. But a man who already knew how to weld was not. So, disciples who had already studied the Torah under the Pharisaic schools and had learned to interpret the Bible, the, their Bible, according to those traditions and learn how to interpret according to their models would probably not be interested in a new approach. And what's more, they'd be inclined to disregard contradictory teaching to what they'd already received because they have already formed opinions and they've made judgments and they would regard the education they've already received as superior. And now we can see that Jesus has chosen fishermen and tax collectors precisely because of their lack of formal education. They do not have a head full of ideas that have to be painstakingly dismantled and reformed in the correct manner. Have a zoom forward in history to see the product of Jesus' education, of his educational process, and you can look to see that in Acts chapter 4. The Sanhedrin there questions the disciples Peter and John, and in chapter 4 verse 13 Luke writes, Now, as the Sanhedrin observed the confidence of Peter and John, and understood that they were uneducated and untrained men, they were amazed and began to recognise them as having been with Jesus. On that day, when two poorly educated fishermen stood before the Sanhedrin, they demonstrated the full measure, the full calibre of their education under Jesus, and they vindicated his choice of disciples. Jesus had taught them well. They were not new patches on old garments, they were new garments, new wineskins and new students. And now the last line of the parable makes sense. And no one after drinking old wine wants the new, for they say the old is better. People trained under the old system, under the scribes and Pharisees, already have their minds made up. They've made their decisions. They will take the known and the learnt over new ideas any day. For them, the old is definitely better. And a couple of ways of applying that nowadays. Notice how people will hold on to what they have learned, the old, even in the face of wonderful new teaching. They will hold on to the old. For the old is better. For them, it's comfortable. It's known. They've made it a habit. And this has implications for bringing up our children in the Lord. Notice the importance of getting there first. Of getting foundational biblical concepts in your kids' minds before other people put their concepts in. Put good stuff in there from an early age. They say most of the great questions in life have been asked by the time you are four years old. Kids are never too young to hear Christian biblical ideas. Don't let them fight with all the contemporary rubbish they face today on their own. Enter into your child's world. Ask them probing questions about why they do things. What are, what are they thinking? Don't be afraid to talk about your faith. And don't be afraid to live your faith boldly in front of them. Don't give in to uh, this rubbish view that I oh, will let them decide for themselves when they're old enough. They can only make good decisions as good as the information and ideas that they have first been given. So get in there first. Train your kids up in the way they should go and when they were old they will not depart from it. Indeed, don't hand education of your child all over to the public school system. Be strongly involved in teaching content. Be strongly involved in living out your Christianity so that they become Christians like you. 
You may be no good at reading, writing and arithmetic, but you can be great at showing your kids what a real Christian looks like. And another implication from this parable is that uh, you don't really want to use it as a justification for changing the church to something new. Something which you'd like it to be. Don't use this parable as your raison d'etre, your platform for changing structures, for changing organisations, for changing church practices. Rather, change yourself to be more like Jesus. Use this parable as a spur to really study the Bible to see what teaching Jesus has lined up for you personally. You see, he wants you concerned more about changing yourself to be more like Jesus than changing the church to be more like you. Because at the bottom line, people who want to change the church so often want to change the church to be like them, with the things in it that they like, with people who are like them, doing things in the way they like and the way they respond. But Jesus' aim is for all people to say of us when they look at us, to say what they said of Peter and John, these men have been with Jesus. Let us pray. Oh Lord, let us not be stuck in the old ways so much that we can't learn something new from your word. And let us always be growing in the knowledge of your word, in learning to be a better disciple. May people be able to say of us, these people have been with Jesus. Amen and God bless.